Perfecto. Bueno, ya estamos en, fe en Facebook. Thank you so much, Jogen. We are on Facebook right now. We are transmitting live to everybody, to all Amer Latin American people and Mexican audience. I'm going to speak in Spanish for a while, Jogen, if you all That's me. That's absolutely fine, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes a todos. Les agradecemos nuevamente estén con, con todos nosotros aquí en un webinario de la Asociación Mexicana de Ultrasonografía Crítica y Urgencias con su unidad de entrenamiento internacional en la ciudad de Guadalajara. Estamos eh, eh, honrados en esta ocasión por tener un invitado tan especial desde Cambridge, Inglaterra. Tenemos al doctor Jogen Singh. Él está, en, desde luego, en la Universidad de Cambridge. Y vamos a, a tener un tema muy interesante para toda nuestra comunidad de pediatras y neonatólogos que se interesan por el ultrasonido point of care, por el ultrasonido de urgencias, y específicamente sobre la ecocardiografía. En, este, en esta ocasión vamos a hablar sobre cómo el ecocardiograma nos permite evaluar eh, la hemodinamia de nuestros pacientes neonatos y niños. Y pues tenemos a un, un verdadero experto, ya que el doctor Jogen, como ustedes han visto y saben de él, pues él ha estado involucrado en varios consensos internacionales, en recomendaciones internacionales sobre la, el uso de la ecocardiografía para pediatras neonatólogos. Así que esta comunidad tan grande que tenemos de pediatras eh, interesados en la ultrasonografía crítica, pues es verdaderamente un honor y estamos muy contentos de tener esta, esta presentación. Un saludo a todos nuestros amigos en Latinoamérica, en Brasil, en Uruguay, en Colombia, en Ecuador, en Chile, en Perú, etc. Sabemos que hay mucha gente que nos sigue. Y bueno, eh, cuando vean este webinario en el transcurso de los, de los días, de las horas, Indíquenos dónde están, desde dónde nos están escuchando. Y bueno, pues aquí están también, pueden expresar sus comentarios. Por si quieren hacer alguna pregunta, la pueden hacer a través de, del chat en Facebook o directamente en nuestra plataforma. En este momento ustedes podrán eh, también interactuar con el doctor. Así que al final ustedes pueden levantar la mano a través de una función que viene en la plataforma desde su celular, etcétera. Y pueden hacer las preguntas que quieran, doctor Yogen. Estamos verdaderamente ante un experto neonatólogo ecocardiografista. Así que espero lo, lo aprovechemos y este, de verdad eh, pueden hacer todas las preguntas que quieran. Así que vamos a iniciar con este webinario sobre la evaluación ecocardiográfica de la hemodinamia en neonatos y niños. Demos de la bienvenida al doctor Jogen. Thank you so much, Jogen. Really, really appreciate your attention. Really, really, uh, we are honored by your presence. Thank you for being part of this webinar, Jogen. Let's get started with your conference. That's great, Joan. Thank you very much. My Spanish was is not great, so I didn't understand much, but we'll start now with the topic. Yes. Don't worry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. So we are going to start uh, straight about the echocardiographic evaluation of the hemodynamics in neonates and children. So as Joan said, I'm a consultant neonatologist, and, and I also do half of my job in pediatric cardiology, and I'm an associate lecturer in the clinical school at the University of Cambridge. So the echocardiographic evaluation of the hemodynamics has been um, quite hot topic for the last about 10 years or so in the neonates and the PICU. It all started with the different guidelines, with the, with the international guidelines, like with the North American TNE guideline, targeted neonatal echocardiography guidelines. Then the UK, we published our neonatologist performed echocardiography, that's the NPE for the UK. And then in the Europe, then we got the European NPE guidelines and recommendations. There's no such guideline at the moment for the PICU, but we are in the process of developing the European guidelines for the same, for the point of care ultrasound in the intensive care. So that's sort of the background and why there is a need. Why are we talking about the echocardiographic evaluation of hemodynamics? Currently, less that's the parameters of what we have got in the NICU or PICU or even general peds. If any child, any neonate needs hemodynamic monitoring, so what we do? We check the uh, pulses, clinical examination. We check the capillary refill time, blood pressure heart rate, oxygen saturation levels, urine output, weight, serum lactate. They're great, they're fantastic. We have been doing this for many years. Why we do it? Because they're easy, we can ask nurses and they can be continuously monitored. But if you look carefully, none of these parameters 
tell about the cardiovascular well-being directly. They are the indirect and the proxy parameters of the tissue perfusion. If you got the advanced hemodynamic monitoring, like in the PICU or the cardiac intensive care, like CICU, where we can monitor the central venous pressure, mixed oxygen saturation, NIRS, perfusion index, or non-invasive cardiac output, they are better parameters, but sadly, they are not easily available in the emergency situations, and they are not practical in the preterms and the NICU. So in those limitations, now we have got a, our friend, which is point of care ultrasound. That's the targeted echocardiography to provide the direct anatomical and physiological information in real time. So on this one, we published a advanced in diagnosis and management of shock. You guys can read this paper in the Frontiers in Pediatrics 2017. That's freely available and you can download. But today we are going to focus mainly on the hemodynamic evaluation on the echocardiography. When I talk about this topic, there are different subtopics you can cover in this one. You can talk about the fluid, assessing the fluid uh, filling of the heart, fluid volume, cardiac filling and fluid responsiveness, assessment of the cardiac output and flow, assessment of cardiac function, echocardiographic assessment in pulmonary hypertension, for the NICU, it can be specifically a hemodynamic assessment of the patent ductus arteriosus, and then the advanced echocardiography. I know we cannot cover everything today. It's a very big topic. And those guys who are interested in reading more about the echocardiograph echocardiographic evaluation, again, we published a top, a, an article on the echocardiographic evaluation of hemodynamics in units and children last year in Frontiers in Pediatrics. And just this year in the 2018, um, uh, we published functional echocardiography in an ICU. Please free to download these one if you want to read. They are um, uh, a freely PDF is available. Now in the next 30, 35 minutes, I'm going to focus on the first four parameters. Let's talk about the assessment of the cardiac failing and the fluid responsiveness. So let's look at these two images on the screen. You can see this on this side, you can see there's the apical four chamber. Here, there's the left ventricle and there's the right ventricle. There's the left atrium, right atrium. Anybody even without any expertise in ultrasound or echocardiography will agree with me. This side looks quite small and right ventricle looks quite big. And in fact, if you look carefully, there's a what you call kissing sign or the free wall and the interventricular septum, they are approximating, they're touching each other. This suggests to me there's a hypovolemia of the left ventricle, left side of the heart, that's underfilled heart. On the other side, on this image, you can see the left ventricle and the left atrium, they're quite big and dilated. So just putting a probe on the, ap on the apical four chamber in within few seconds, you can tell this heart is overfilled and this is underfilled. This is simply by eyeballing. But if you want to make more objective assessment, we have got certain parameters we can check for the hypervolemia or hypervolemia. One of the parameters is the IVC, that's the inferior vena cava collapsibility. So this is the inferior vena cava, that's a subcostal view. Here you can see the, in the during the inspiration expiration, inferior vena cava is collapsing. That's the, about 15 to 50 percent collapsibility is normal. This side you can see already collapsed inferior vena cava very tiny, suggestive of the hypovolemia. As compared to other one, in this one there is no collapsibility at all. Now this is normal physical physiological collapsibility, and this one is no collapsibility at all, which suggesting is hypervolemia, already heart is overfilled. And if you do the M mode, again, I'll talk about the M mode in a second, then there's absolutely no variation in the diameter of the IVC. So IVC collapsibility and variability is well 
tested in the adults and the children who are not ventilated, we extrapolate the same information to the children in the PICU or in the NICU as well, although it has not been tested in the research studies, but this is pretty well recognized parameter. Other parameter which can be really important is the looking on the left ventricular artery tract, velocity time integral, that's the Doppler in the left ventricular artery tract. Let me take you through this, how to do it. This is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. This is the apical five chamber view now. You can see the left ventricular outflow tract. In this case, what I've done, I put my sample gate at this level and then measure the left ventricular cardiac output, or you can simply do the Dopplers. If they, they look similar size, it means heart is well filled. If there's a big variation, about 15, more than 15%, like some are small, some are tall, big, that's the velocity time integral diameter under these areas varies more than 15%, then these babies that baby is likely to respond to the food bolus and it's a suggestion of hypovolemia. Now we'll move on to assessment of the cardiac output and the flow measurement. So this is a simple principle which we apply to measure the cardiac output across any area. That principle based on this phys physical principle, cardiac output is equal to cross-sectional area multiplied by the velocity time integral, multiplied by the heart rate. Where CSA is the cross-sectional area of the vessel, VTI is the velocity time integral, and heart rate is the, just we get the, um, from the monitor. Let's look in more details if you want to look on the left ventricular cardiac output. If you want to measure the left ventricular cardiac output, then we need to measure the area of the left ventricular outflow tract, and traditionally we do at the annulus of the aortic valve, multiply by the stroke distance in the left ventricle outflow tract, the VTI, multiply by the heart rate. Let me take you through how we do it on the echocardiography. This is the aortic valve diameter we went to measure. That's the hinge point of the aortic valve. And thus we can do the B mode or we can do M mode, but I normally do in the B mode. Stroke distance, we do in the apical five chamber view, where we do the pulse wave Doppler at the hinge point, exactly the same site. How we do it? That's the epic, that's the parastol long axis view on the echocardiography. That's the left atrium, left ventricle. So classically for the left ventricle, we measure the diameter in the parastinal long axis view. So we, that's the area of interest. We zoom it and then we can phrase it. And that's the annulus of the aortic valve. Now, once machine is preset, once you get this diameter, it will automatically give the cross-sectional area. As I was talking about the VTI, for the left ventricular outflow tract, if you put the sample gate there, machine will automatically calculate the VTI if we trace this pulse wave Doppler. So how we do it? Get the pulse wave Doppler, like this spectral, and you have to do this bit manually. So trace one of the spectral around this one. And once you do this, the VTI, and machine will calculate automatically the cardiac output. Like in this case, it's about 428 mils per minute. If you divide it by the, uh, by, by the weight of the baby or child, that will give us cardiac output, left ventricle cardiac output in mils per kg per minute. We can do the same for the right ventricle cardiac output. Similar principle, same principle. Now we measure the diameter of the pulmonary valvular annulus and, and the 2D similar in the right ventricle, uh, the, uh, that's the right ventricular fruit tract, that's the pulmonary valve, that's the main pulmonary artery. Normally we do in the parastinal short axis view or the, or the tilted parastinal long axis view. And then we get the spectral and measure the VTI exactly same way how we do it in the left ventricle. And that's how we can assess the cardiac output of the left ventricle or the right ventricle. Now in the PICU or in the older children, when there's no shunt across the PDA, PFO, this is fantastic. And this well-tested, well-validated in the bigger children or the adults to measure the 
left ventricle or the right ventricle cardiac output. And this is absolutely fantastic when to see a child is, has got low cardiac output status or normal cardiac output status. Now, as we know, cardiac output can be low from the hypovolemia, from the contractility, or can be from the heart rate. Once we know what's wrong with the child on the hemodynamic evaluation, we can focus our management to improve that part of the, uh, th th that, that part which is deranged. If the cardiac contactility is poor, we can improve the contactility by the inotropes. If there's hypovolemia, we can give the, uh, we can give the fluid bolus or blood product, whatever is needed. So that's why it's very important to look on the different pathophysiology based on the cardiac output assessment. So I was talking how to do it. So this is the modified parastone long axis view. That's the left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle. That's the right ventricle output tract. Similar to the left ventricle, we're measuring this annulus of the pulmonary valve. And then we, on the pulse rate Doppler, put the sample again exactly where we did and, and measure the diameter. Hit the PW button, pulse rate Doppler, and then we trace one of the spectral all around, and then we get the right ventricular cardiac output. In this case, it's 970 mils per, per minute. We divide the weight, then we get the mils per kg per minute to get the cardiac index. I'll skip this one. There has been a lot of interest in the superior vena cava. Again, I do not use superior vena cava flow in my clinical practice. It's a great research tool. And the reason interest came really because in the neonates, people, people were interested in measuring the cardiac output only from the upper part of the body in presence of the PDA to avoid the contamination of the shunt by the PDA. So I'll talk you through how to do it, but you can see the problem. This is the SVC. You can see it's collapsing. It's not like the annulus of the atrial valve or pulmonary valve, where it's non-collapsible. This is collapsible structure, and the, on the MRI, it looks like a D-shaped structure. So if we measure in cystic diastole, diameter will be different, and that's why there's a lot of intra-observer and intra-observer variability up to 35 to 50%. But if you want to do it, how we do it, once we get this image, we do the M mode. On the M mode, then we get the this kind of structure. You can see there's difference in the diameter in during inspiration and during expiration or during systole and diastole. So this based on the cardiac cycle and the respiratory is change in the diameter is there. That's the how we measure the diameter to measure to, to measure the dopplers. Then we go the subcostally, and from the subcostal we look towards the superior vena cava, and then we do pulse rate Doppler, and then we trace it just exactly how the left and right ventricle cardiac output, and we use the same formula to assess the SVC flow. There are normal values like 50 to 150 mils per kg per minute, and this, this can help in assessing the hypovolemia. But as I said, there are limitations and one should be aware of the limitations. Then it comes really about the assessing, when you use these parameters, assessing the hypovolemia, you should be mindful of the limitations in presence of the shunts, like the neonates with the PFO, PDA, like the left ventricle cardiac output in a neonate will be pulmonary venous return plus the PDA shunt. Similarly, on the right ventricle cardiac output will be systemic venous return plus the atrial shunt, that is the PFO. Nonetheless, even the absolute values may differ between the observers, sometimes like the SVC flow, but trend is important. If you are, see a child, measure the at one value, if you give fluid bolus or start inotropes, assess it again, how is the response to your intervention? That's why trend of these parameters is the more important than a single value. Now we'll move on to the assessing the LV function. I'll just take you through the important hemodynamic parameters, which are really important, basic one. I'm not talking the advanced function assessment. So just from the eyeballing, like the filling of the heart, in this case, anybody will agree with me, this side of the heart 
looks very poor cardiac functions. As compared to this side on the screen, you can see good cardiac functions. It's the same baby on the different stages of the illness. In this one, you can see contractility is very poor, heart is hard to be moving. As compared to on this side is good contractility. But if you want to measure the, it objectively, then you have to do more quantitative tests. This is the qualitative only. So do the, to do the qu quantitatively for the LV functions, what we do, we measure the fraction shortening. That's the easiest to do. You people do in the uh, outpatient clinics, PIC or NIC, everywhere it can be done. The important point is to get a good parasternal long axis view. That's the left atrium, left ventricle, left ventricle foot tract, right ventricle. So what we want to do really, we want to get ventricle septum as horizontal as possible. And this is our area of interest. So we want to put a cursor line in this area, just distal to the mitral leaflets in this area here. So we know the normal values, 28 to 46% in neonates or the bigger children. So how we do it, let's see. That's the personal long axis view. If you get this cursor line in this area, and then hit the M mode button, then we get this kind of image. Now, this one is the diastole, and this is the systole. Fraction shortening is the left ventricle diameter in diastole minus left ventricle diameter in systole divided by the left ventricle di and diastolic diameter, LVEDD. The good thing is you don't need to do all these calculations by yourself. Once you get this image, then we go to the LV study and we look on the different values. It's well guided by the machine. But finally, once you measure these measurements, we get the fraction shortening and the ejection fraction. You can see here the different parameters. That's the interventricular septum in diastole, interventricular septum in systole, similarly LV cavity in diastole and systole, and posterior wall in diastole and systole. So these are the parameters we're talking about. And that's why I was talking about how to do it, but the machine automatically does it for us. That's how it will look like, how we, how we are doing the fraction shortening. You can also use the parasternal short axis view to do the same. Again, whichever view is more clear, crystal clear, so that you can see the interventricular septum. So this is the interventricular septum here, and this is the posterior free wall. So if you get a cursor line here, it will cut the image at 90 degree and we should get a good image of para on the M mode. Again, similar measurements on the LV study and we get the fraction shortening. This is the systolic function of the left ventricle. To measure the diastolic, what we do is the, we measure the, for the LV side with the mitral inflow Dopplers. Again, the same pulsar Dopplers. So get the apical four chamber view this mitral inflow, put the sample gate in the inflow in the LV cavity and hit the pulse wave Doppler. Then you get this kind of image. Two waves are there. That's the E wave and that's the A wave. So normally E wave is taller than the A wave in children's and the older neonates. Soon after birth, E wave may be bigger. If you got the abnormal diastolic functions, where the filling is of the ventricle is restricted. In that case, they may be, the E wave may be taller because A wave is coming from the passive filling of the atrium in the early part of the diastole, E wave. And A wave is coming from the atrial contraction in the second part of the diastole. So that's why if the ventricle filling is, is, is derenched, like in the cardiomyopathies or where the volume overloading, LV is already filled, in that case, those children, they may need more atrial contraction to get the, for the filling of the ventricle in diastole and A wave can be taller. Again, I'm not going to talk about a lot of on the advanced echocardiography. We can talk in a different talk, but this one is a very simple echocardi echocardiographic assessment to assess the functions, especially diastolic or it can do both systolic and diastolic. 
that is called tissue Doppler imaging. So in this case, what we are doing, rather than doing the pulse wave Doppler into the blood flow, into the blood vessels or the heart cavity, we want to measure the heart contractions itself. So how the heart contracts this is the apex. In systole, this part of the heart from the AV valve comes towards the apex and diastole goes back. So heart contracts comes towards the apex. So this apex part is relatively constant. So it goes like this. So we want to measure the cardiac movements in this area here. We want to Doppler the, this myocardium tiny segments. So once we hit the area of interest, normally we have three area of interest are one at the interventricular septum, like at this area, one at the on the left side to, uh, near the annulus, near the hinge point here, and on the tricuspid side the, near uh, the junction of the free wall with the tricuspid valve in this area. And once you do the hit the pulse with Doppler button now, we'll get this kind of image where you get the different cycles. Now we call this one is the S prime wave, is the E prime wave, and is the A prime wave. You can do different parameters. Again, I'm not going to, to talk in much details, but these S prime wave reflects the systolic functions, and E prime wave and A prime wave represents the diastolic functions. That's equivalent to the E and A wave. So in only one image, you can the systolic and the diastolic functions of the left or the right ventricle. People talk about the myocardial performance index. Again, once you got this image, then we can measure the IV RT and IV CT. That's the uh, intra and uh, that's the contraction time, isovolumic contraction time, IV CT. That's the isovolumic relaxation time. So MPI, myocardial, perf myocardial performance index or time index is the IV CT plus IVRT, so this is IVRT divided by the ejection time. This is the ejection time here between uh, from there to there, so, or you can see red one there. So if you divide this one, that's the MPI, normal values are 0 0.28 to 0 0.32, or simply put a one line from the start of the isovolumic contraction time to the end of the isovolumic relaxation time. This is the big A. So A, this line, B is the ejection time, A minus B, and that's give the tie index. So that was the all uh, simply about the basic functions on the, on the LV with the neonatologist, intensivist, or emergency care physicians can perform easily fraction shortening, E and A waves, and if really learn then the TDI tissue Doppler imaging. Now, about the RV functions, they are slightly difficult. The reason for that one is the geometry. This is the LV. LV is a more circular structure, so geometry is easy. RV is electrical. This is curved around the left ventricle, so it becomes slightly difficult for us to measure the RV functions. So it's technically more challenging. And also it is behind the uh, anterior, um, anteriorly behind the septum as well. So traditionally we have been using eyeballing. Like this one, there's no doubt RV functions, including LV functions are very poor. So just eyeballing. But if you want to do more objective assessment, we can do the fraction area shortening, RV, FNC or FAC, fraction, fraction area shortening. But those are slightly technically more challenging to, for this talk, we'll keep it more simple. We can do TAPSI. TAPSI is basically what we are doing, just as explaining how the heart contracts. In a similar way, if we put the, our sample gate here, we measure these myocardial movements in systole when it comes towards the apex, that will give the systolic excursion of the tachycardia speed valve, valve. That's called TAPSI. So how we do it? We put the sample gate there and hit the M mode, just like the fraction shortening. Now we get this kind of image, and from there to there, that's the systolic movements of the this part of the heart that reflects the right ventricle. Or we can do DE excursion. That's the same value we get really. 
autopsy is easy to do is simple reproducible and we know the normal values in adults children including the neonates as well in my practice i use eyeballing plus autopsy and tissue doppler imaging but in research then you can look on the fraction area shortening and more advanced parameters of the rv function as well so um again i'm talking the tissue doppler imaging similar exactly like the lv we can do the s prime wave e and a prime wave that will be the systolic and diastolic functions of the rv as well if you want to measure the systolic functions do two things one tapsy and one the s prime wave on the tdi they are the excellent markers of the rv systolic function for the diastolic again e and a prime wave on just like the left side of the heart so that was a in nutshell a assessment of the cardiac functions for a neonatologist or for a intensivist now we briefly will talk about the echocardiographic assessment of the pulmonary hypertension again it's a full talk itself of 45 minutes but we will keep it very basic and we'll look on the common parameters what we commonly use one of the parameter which is in very important is to look on the pulmonary artery pressure how to assess the pulmonary artery systolic pressures this is based on the modified bernoulli's equation but it needs either tricuspid regurgitation or a shunt which can be at the pda level or vst level if they are there so how we do it if there is a tricuspid regurgitation or there is a um, or there is a shunt across between left and right then we try to measure the then we measure the pressure gradient between the two chambers like let me talk you through the modified bernoulli's equation is equal to pressure is equal to 4 times square of the velocity in the next slide i'll talk about this one it's not difficult it's easy and then once we know the pressure gradient for the right ventricle if you know the pressure gradient between the right ventricle right atrium and we add the right atrial pressures that will be the right ventricle systolic pressure which is which is exactly the pulmonary artery pressures so it's p that's the calculated plus we add the right atrial pressure which is normally 5 to 10 mm mercury so how we do it that's the apical four chamber and you can see this the this bit of blue jet that's the tri and that's the tricuspid regurgitation so blood coming towards my r probe is blue away going backwards into the right atrium is the blue jet is the tricuspid regurgitation again if the sample get there and they hit the pulse wave well hit the continuous wave doppler because a high velocity if you do the pulse wave doppler they will be aliasing we cannot measure the high velocities so we do the cd blue and that will lead to the this kind of spectral and we measure the peak one this is the in this case 4 meter per second that will give us a pressure gradient in this case about 66 between the right ventricle and the right atrium so essentially once you got the tr hitting the button cw and measure at this point we will give the pressure gradient with the rv and ra and we add the right atrial pressures that will be the right ventricle systolic pressures which is equal into the pulmonary artery pressures like in this case it is 4 times square velocity plus 4 into 4 64 plus 5 to 10 somewhere around 70 to 75 mm mercury sometime tricuspid regurgitation is not present different studies report different incidences so uh, but generally is present in about 2/3 of the children one of one third of the children may not have any tr despite being pulmonary hypertensive and they may or may not have any pda to assess the pressure gradient or the vst but now we got different echo para parameters which are good friends we can use them to assess the systolic pressures in the right ventricle or the pulmonary artery pressures one of them is the assessing the interventricular septum shape or the rv let me talk you through so no that's the normal image on this side left ventricle circular structure this is interventricular septum 
This is the, uh, the LV free wall. These are the anterior and posterior papillary muscles. RV, as we're talking, is a elliptical shape structure around it. So why it is so? LV pressures are much higher than the RV pressures. Like a normal heart, LV pressures will be 50, 60, 70 neonates or around 100 in older children or maybe 120 in adults. RV pressures are never more than 15, 20, more than 25 is the pulmonary hypertension. If RV pressures increases, it means it will start pushing the interventricular septum towards the LV. It will become flat, and then it can go into the left ventricle. As you can see here, in this image, LV has become a D-shaped structure. RV has become a more or less circular structure. Now, this in one image tell us RV pressures are higher than the systolic pressures. Systolic we can get from the easily from the either monitors or measure the, uh, the systolic blood pressure. So if it's flattened, it may be equal pressures on both sides. So you can look on the mild, moderate, severe. It won't give exact number, but it tells about whether hypertension is there or not. Sorry, just a second. So the, to get this image, we need to get a parastone short axis view, mark it towards the left shoulder, and then look onto the left ventricle cavity. And once you go into the LV cavity, look on the, this is LV and this is RV. So, other parameter which can be very useful is looking the spectral in the pulmonary artery. When there's no pulmonary hypertension, if we good get the pulse wave Doppler in the pulmonary artery, like this is normal. In this case, nice and smooth, gradually goes up, reach to the maximum, comes back, then diastole and the systole again. If the pressures in the lungs are high, there's a pulmonary artery pressures, uh, pulmonary hypertension, right vent side of the ventricle, try to generate this pressure that leads to this maximum very early. So it's become a bit notched like this. I say dichrotic notch, in this case that's here. So what it means really, time to the peak velocity in this case, that's the, this, this distance become very short. We can measure this one. So this is the time to peak velocity, that's normal. In this case, that's become very short. The time to peak velocity when it's very short, then it's a suggestion of the pulmonary artery pulmonary hypertension. In units, if less than 90 milliseconds, there's a 95% sensitivity is there, or and specificity, there's a pulmonary hypertension is there. In older children, this is less than 110 milliseconds. Or we can do the ratio of the time to peak velocity or the pulmonary artery acceleration time to the right ventricular ejection time. Again, if it's less than 0.31, it is suggestive of the pulmonary hypertension. Again, you don't have to spend a lot of time measuring in the emergency. You can look on the, how is it looking or is it dichrotic notch type? That gives some idea and you've got time, then you can measure them. But one thing is for sure for the hemodynamic evaluation, as you can see, there are a lot of measurements. If you don't get a good images, what I normally call it garbage in, garbage out. And also there's no single image echo parameter is perfect to assess the whole of the hemodynamics. We have to look at the different cardiac function, di different parameters, different views. Heart is a 3D structure. Machines are 2D. So you have to get the different views and then look on the what works best for, the, uh, for that baby. So I'll stop my talk here, but anything, um, any questions or you want to discuss anything more details, then we can, uh, I, I'm I'll happy to take any questions. So let me finish um, the last slide. This one is the, as we're talking about the, for the fraction shortening or this is a long axis view. One image tells a very good functions. RV looks small cavity as compared to just one image here, parasitic long axis view, very discontinued movements, very volume, volume overloaded heart of the right ventricle. 
maybe RV is failing in this ventricle. So for the intensivist or, or for the neonatologist, it's very important to get the basic good views, apical four chamber view, perhaps long axis view, short axis view, and that, then look on the different, what you are trying to assess really, whether you assess in the volume, assess in the cardiac functions, or we are looking on the, uh, or whether we're looking on the uh, LVR RV functions or pulmonary hypertension. Intentionally, I have not talked about the PDA and also I have not talked about the, about the advanced echocardiography. I'm more than happy to take any questions. I'll stop it there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jogan. Thank you for your nice presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on so for the questions, uh, Jogan. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, there, there is one question yeah. about the superior cava vein. In, yeah. this, in this case, do you use a transesophageal echocardiography for uh, the assessment of the superior cava vein in order to, to evaluate the fluid responsiveness? Or are you are using in pediatricians, in neonates, are you, do you use uh, transthoracic echocardio? So transesophageal won't be very practical, Joan, in the NICU or even the, most of the PICU. So we use transthoracic, uh, trans, transthoracic TTE, really, transthoracic echocardiography. You can measure the diameter from the hybrid between the person's short and long axis view and get the SVC as horizontal as possible. So uh, let me go back in the image. Great. I'll show you that there. Great. So this one is the image, which is a hybrid between the person long and short axis V transthoracic. Now this one is the uh, right atrium, that's the SVC. If it's oblique like this, you won't be able to measure the diameter uh, accurately. You can do from the right side, between the right side of the chest, but it will become more little bit oblique. So try to get as horizontal as possible so that you can minimize the uh, uh, bias on the measuring the diameter. Okay. As I, sorry, as I was saying, <clears throat> in my clinical practice, I do not use the SVC flow exact numbers because there's a high variability between the observe, between the echocardiographers, right. 35 to 40%. But if you want to use it, get the one value and assess the what happens after the fluid intervention. If you give fluid bolus, start inotropes, what happens after the intervention? Right, thank you, Jogen. And in uh, talking about fluid responsiveness, in, specifically Jogen in pediatricians, yeah. in pediatrics patients, uh, what, in your opinion, what uh, the best method is for evaluating fluid responsiveness by echocardiography, Jogen? So I will say that the one is qualitative. If you and I, like somebody's experienced, eyeballing be, will be as good as the other parameters. But best parameter will be looking on the velocity time integral into the LV cavity because that would be, if that's a fit, more than 15% variability in that one. One of the spectral is small, one is large, and that was the best parameter. Then second one, second one is the IVC collapsibility variability. Right, very good, Jogan. Thank you. Well, there is uh, one question for uh, from Fernando Montes. Él está preguntando cuál es el mejor indicador de hipertensión. Eh, me imagino que hipertensión pulmonar en pacientes con hernia diafragmática. Si estoy bien, Fernando, o quieres eh, te puedo dar audio si quieres hacer mejor esta pregunta. Pero estoy entendiendo que cuál es el mejor indicador de hipertensión pulmonar debe ser en pacientes con hernia diafragmática sí me dice que sí es correcto in, in English uh, Jogen what uh -huh. in, your, in your opinion uh, the, the Fernando Montes is wondering what is the best indicator uh, for evaluating pulmonary hypertension hypertension in patients with diaphragmatic hernia absolutely thank you that's a great question as well Joan like yours Thank you. So um, there is no single best parameter to assess the pulmonary hypertension. If there is a tricuspid regurgitation, always look on the TR because you can assess the pulmonary RD pressures measuring the tricuspid regurgitation. The two limitations are there. Sometimes it can be absent in like about ten, at least about 25-30% cases. Second limitation, if the RV functions are poor, in that case it may be absent as well. So if the RV functions are okay, 
that there is no right ventricular atrial tract obstruction, the TR is there, it's the best parameter. Right. If the there is no if the TR is absent, then in that case, second best parameter will be looking on the shape of the interventricle, uh, interventricular septum and the LV cavity. Okay. Then the second best parameter. And then obviously, if those are not there, if the PDA, you can look at the shunt of the PDA is bidirectional or left to right, right to left. The right to left shunt will tell you pressures in the right side, it means pulmonary pressures are higher than the systemic size, suprasystemic. Right. If it's a bidirectional, pressures will be more or less same like the systemic side, bidirectional shunt. Left to right will, won't tell you how pressures are, but it will tell you pulmonary pressures are less than systemic. Those will be the indirect parameters. Thank you, Jogan. Thank you. Thank well, you. Uh, there is one uh, one more question. Doctor Seja pregunta si en recién nacidos, ¿cuál método es el mejor para evaluar la función del ventrículo izquierdo, la función sistólica, el tape or symptoms? Jogan, one doctor is wondering, uh, in newborns, why, yeah. which, which is the best method to evaluate the uh, left ventricle uh, systolic function? Uh, Take calls or Simpson? What's your best method in your opinion? Fantastic. That's a great question. I, I hidden those slides. So absolutely. <laughs> so when we're talking of the LA functions, I was not sure like, like what will be, who I'll be talking to and a few things I are hidden. So definitely fraction shortening assess the only the radial and the circumferential functions. Most of the contractions, systolic contractions are in the longitudinal side. So that's why Simpson's method will be far better, but it's a little bit more complicated. And obviously then you have to measure this one. New needs can be tricky. So that's how we do it. This is the left ventricle. You need to get a biventricular reef and the, and the apical four chamber reef. And in this case, we trace the endo, uh, endocardium and divide the LV cavity into 20 days. This method is definitely better if you get a good trace of the endocardium so you need to get a good apical four chamber and two chamber view, and then look on the, uh, divide the LV cavity. Fraction shortening is easy, time tested, very fast, very reproducible, but it is not the best parameter for the LV functions. In my view, best will be look on the, if you have really good time, you can do a strain, look on the tissue Doppler imaging and the Simpson's method will be better. There's one method what we use really is a bullet method as well, where we look on the uh, look on the uh, contractions, both, both uh, longitudinal and the circumferential. Again, a little bit more complicated for the intensivist. Right, thank you, Shogun. Okay, very good. Uh, one more question. Um, uh, ¿Cómo afecta la ventilación de alta frecuencia en la toma de parámetros cardiovasculares, Jogan? Uh, one doctor is wondering, how the when, when you are using high frequency ventilatory oscillating uh, ventilation yes, uh, how uh, these uh, measurements the cardiovascular parameters are affected when you are using hfbo so that's a really great question and that tells and tell us how the why these functions can be really difficult in the difficult situations so normally what I do really in my practice, if the child has got a, like say, meconium aspiration syndrome or child is getting worse, before switching to the high frequency, I often do a quick assessment of the echocardiography, basic views, and that's the one way to do it. But once you put on the oscillation, in that case, you have to be mindful because assessing the contractility, it will, it will vary. Sometimes eyeballing may be the best option, but if you have to do more objective assessment, you have to just get the best images subcostally as much as you can, because it will affect the cardiac functions assessment. Also, if you use the high mean area pressure on the oscillation, it may be like IVC can become very big, like the volume loaded heart, because intrathoracic pressure increases, that will decrease the venous return to the heart. So it will, may look like the heart is well filled. So, I'll show you some pictures. It's not, you get, getting good quality pictures is not that difficult. Let me show you one of the, one of the other study and um, then I'll show you something. 
once you get a good uh, image is sub costly from the windows or you can find thoracic windows they are not that bad images actually on the uh, even the oscillation so let me show you this one these these are on oscillation only right thank you so so these images are child is oscillated it's really getting the either go sub costly or get a good window and then stabilize and put the probe between the ventricle between the ribs and try to get sometimes it's not easy so i appreciate that it's not always possible as good as all the time for the assessment okay thank you thank you jorin and well uh, one more question jorin um do you use uh, tdi when you are trying to extubate patients or in the winning process, do you think uh, the TDI is useful to evaluate the pulmonary wet pressures, for instance? So, so definitely, I think if child is getting worse, we measure the, these fun assessments more often. If child is getting better during the winning, you, right. you can go clinically because you do, you do, not, do not want to treat the echocardiography images numbers. So if child is getting better, oxygen coming is coming down, gases are better, and you, everything is going in the right direction. You may not want to repeat these numbers again. Uh, but if you want to do it, definitely that will be helpful. If cardiac function is better, in that case, next time you know that child is going to be better. Like this image, in this one, I just I've opened this, uh, uh, this child. In this case, this is before the intervention. This is a 942. This is a 1019. And like, Within half an hour after the field bolus, we could see the massive difference in the cardiac functions. And then we could win the oscillation and we, you can win. Similar TDI you can use as well, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Jorin. And okay. well, uh, when you are, uh, you mentioned about the uh, assessment of cardiac output by using the pulmonary, the pulmonary flow. Yes. Um, uh, in what cases do you, uh, do you prefer to, to use this method instead of the traditional uh, left, the, uh, the left ventricle tract uh, evalu evaluation? Fantastic, that's a great question as well. This is typically in the pulmonary hypertension because if the, the image I was showing you, if the left ventricle, left side of the heart is hypervolemic, you want to see, uh, is there enough good blood flow going to the lungs? Because if there's not enough blood flow, blood flow going to the lungs, pulmonary blood flow is less. In that case, child will be not oxygenated very well. It's not going to improve. You want to increase the RV cardiac output. Right. So when, when in the pulmonary hypertension, in the children with the uh, PPHN pulmonary hypertension, or in the PDA as well, when they maybe in that case, maybe too much is going, all lungs are flooded with that one as well. So I think these assessments are useful when there's a hypervolume up or hypervolume up either side. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jogan. Well, um, apparently the, there are no more questions. Uh, okay. okay. Let me see. No, no, no. Uh, it seems uh, there are no more questions. Uh, Jogan. Do you, do you want to say something or recommendation for our Mexican and, and Latin American pediatricians? Because, you know, in Mexico and Latin American countries, it's so difficult or challenging that the pediatrician uh, get trained. You know, it's, it's very difficult to, to get access for a formal training, specifically in advanced echocardiography. You know, it, it's yes. quite difficult. Um, and in your opinion, what, uh, the, the pediatrician, uh, what is the, the, the measurements or the assessment of basic echo, uh, uh, echo uh, that the, all the pediatricians uh, most uh, know to use? So let me tell you, Joanne, first of all, you guys are not alone. We are all in the same boat. Okay? <laughs> it's not easy in the European um, side as well. Right, thank so you. It started like around 10 years back when we started to move this training forward, but still we are struggling, still we are trying to make this progress. So I published this along with my colleagues, this um, training um, 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 document, which is the uh, our expert conscious statement in the UK, 2015-16 only, only three years back. Mm -hmm. So to train the neonatology. So for the pediatricians, we have got the 10 years curriculum. It is running for the last 10 years, one year curriculum which is well established in the UK. That's called pediatricians with expertise in cardiology. It's a one year curriculum recognized by the college RCPCH and we have got competency based. But for the neonatologist, there's none. Exactly. Now we've got this program 
but for the last two, three years, but there was none at all because demands and needs of the NICU neonatologists are different than the uh, general pediatrician or pediatrician expert in cardiology. Right. So that's why we developed this program similar in Europe. We published the guidelines yesterday, uh, I mean, last year. Still, we're trying to develop this, trying to set up the curriculum and for the neonatologist. So, and for the PICU, again, point of care ultrasound, there are li very limited number of centers in the uh, which are focused, provide the focus training. So, as you like, like us, we all are trying to find the best way to train maximum intensivist neonatologist. One thing I will say really, if you guys want to develop some program, look on these three, four documents. One, trans, uh, that's the American, that's the TNE document. And one is the NPE, Neonatologist Performed Echocardiography, the UK expert consistent, yes. which is pretty good actually. Uh, our, when we we'll talk about the competency-based, why this is so important to have this safe, what, how many months you should train, how many echoes you need, and uh, how you should maintain your skills. Yes. Then it comes to the European one. It's more or less same, but slightly more easier, lenient one in that case. Thank you. Like traditionally, people are trained like overshadowing just over the shoulder, seeing train themselves with someone. But I will say, if you want to train, try to find a way, proper training, structured training, get your images reviewed by someone because it's very easy to develop bad skills. If you are not good at echocardiography, then if measurements are not, won't be good if basic images are not good. So I will suggest really, if you work a, a, a neonatologist, liaise with the cardiologist and say, listen guys, we need to develop this training program. Mm -hmm. Can we have some two or three or four places to start with in the country where we can train the neonatologist so that they can train others later on? Similar with the intensivist, and that's the only way. Collaboration with the cardiologist, one-to-one -one relationship so that if in doubt, you can speak to them. That's what we're doing. We're trying to work as a collaboration. I think there is a patient benefit. Neonatologist right. working with the intensivist, working with the cardiologist. Thank you. Yes, exactly, Jogan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jogan. Well, eh, aparentemente no hay otras otras preguntas. Eh, pues vamos a dar por terminado este este webinario. Eh, si existiera alguna alguna otra pregunta cuando eh, la sesión o este webinario esté en línea en nuestro sitio de Facebook, pueden hacer desde luego preguntas. Les vo voy a colocar eh, la dirección de correo electrónico del doctor eh, Jogen para en caso de que quisieran hacer directamente una pregunta a su correo, estoy seguro que, que él va a aceptar con mucho gusto el responder la, la pregunta, dado que el doctor, como ustedes saben, es un gran entusiasta por la, por la enseñanza del ultrasonido, de la cardiografía a médicos no cardiólogos. De verdad que estamos muy agradecidos. Jogen, really, really thank you. We appreciate your attention. Really, I, I am saying that uh, I'm going to put the, your email if you allow me for if, if someone in the audience wants to to send you an email with questions and so on. It's absolutely you, fine. Absolutely, John. Not a problem. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jogen. Really, really appreciate your attention. Thank you for for spending this time for, with us. And um, well, apparently there, is, there are no more comments. Um, well, I'm going to finish the, the, the webinar, Jogen. Thank you for your time. Thank My you. My pleasure. This, this My time. pleasure, thank you. Um, and, and see you soon. Uh, Jogen, thank you. Thank you so much for Mexico. And really, really appreciate. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. All the best to develop the training. Let me know if I can be of any assistance or help. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. Jogen. Thank, thank you for your willingness. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.